Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I've got a special guest, Derek Bolt, and basically we're going to talk about bodybuilding, his last competition, plans for the future, all that good shit. Hey guys, so, happy to be back. So, like, bodybuilding definitely has, like, a huge, huge gay audience, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, I'm curious, how did you, like, get started in it? Like, very, very beginning. Let's start there. Yeah. Um, so, I've been weightlifting since I was 16. Just kind of picked it up when I was in high school from... Um, we did a, a session in gym class. I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. And at the same time, I was getting into lacrosse um, as kind of just, hey, I need to be a little bit more social. Um, so I was a little bit of a nerd in high school. Um, and so I started working out, really liked it, kept doing that through high school and all of college. And then I graduated from college and I've been at this point weightlifting since for what's that, like eight years or something. And so my friends were like, dude, you've got the size to do a bodybuilding competition. If you want, you should do at least one and see how you like it. And I was like, okay, why not? So I started training for competition. Um, I started training in November right around after Thanksgiving and did the first one in April of 2017. And that was kind of the start of it. I coached myself, um, came fourth out of six. Um, but I, I felt like, okay, I showed up and I didn't embarrass myself. That's, that's a good start. And I liked it, and so I kept doing it. Um, and as of last Saturday, I have now done seven since 2017, so seven in six years. Jesus. Yeah. So. That's taxing on the body, Bune. It really is. So what – you said you coach yourself the very first competition? Actually, for the first five that I did, yeah. That's pretty fucking impressive. Mm-hmm. What made you go at it alone? You know, I've always been kind of a self-directed person. Um, and I was like, well, I have, a, I've been doing this for a while. I know the diet, I know the nutrition, I know the supplementation. I can do pretty well. And I was a bit younger. Like I was starting this not long after college. So I didn't have a ridiculous amount of money floating around and bodybuilding is already expensive enough. I, it was like, do I really want to be dropping two or $300 a month on a coach? when I've already got a $700 student loan payment that I have to deal with and I'm making like entry level salary. And you know, it, it was really, I mean, start, start out and it still is just a hobby. Like I'm not, I've never made a dime from bodybuilding. Um, so if you, if you want to actually be paid as a bodybuilder, you have to win your local show to qualify for nationals, go to national, win a national competition still haven't made any money. Then you get your pro card, which costs, you have to pay to enter the IFBB pro federation. And then you can start competing and then you can make money from those competitions. But other than like the Olympia and the Arnold, they're not super lucrative. I think a lot of the, um, like the Toronto pro show, I think the open heavyweight, their open bodybuilding class gets like $20,000 of prize money, which is like, I mean, it's good money, but it's not like, live on type of money. Yeah. So most bodybuilders make their money from coaching and sponsorships and um, other, other things like that, that are tangentially related to bodybuilding. So how did you feel after you got done with your very first competition? I was excited. I really enjoyed it. Um, it was fun. I, the show that I did um, as my first one and that I've done, three other times, two other times two, I've done the, that show three or four times. Um, it's done in Woodbridge and it's run by these two ex IFBB pro women. And they're also ex military. So they are very regimented. The show runs extremely smoothly They They set it up so that if you're a beginner, you're not confused. You always know exactly where you need to be, what time you need to be, what's going on. So it was a very easy show to start with. Um, and it's, and again, it's well run. It's reasonably competitive. It's close enough to DC that I, I did it a couple times because it was just like, it's a good place to keep growing. Um, but yeah, so I did that show and I was just excited. Like I came in fourth, but I was like, I'm just happy to 
have gotten up on stage and looked like a bodybuilder. Because you see yeah. guys all the time who they go they go to compete and you're like, did you never look at what a show looks like? Did, like, did you not <laughs> notice that you don't look like the people on stage? Yeah, I've seen a few of those for sure. And so that was that was just my goal was to go and and not embarrass myself. And I hit that. And then I was like, this is fun. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the rigidity of it. I also like I did a six week cut for that. Um which is laughably short in retrospect. Yeah. I mean I've always I never get crazy out of shape. So I was still very lean on stage, but I I look at that and I'm like, I went from doing a six week cut that was pretty tame to like the most ridiculous 16 weeks of my life for this last one. Like 16 weeks, 16 weeks. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm decently familiar with what that looks like, but for like the people watching walk through, like what does a cut look like? Okay. Um, so yeah, so 16 weeks out, I think that would put it the beginning of that mid-August for this show. Um, so mid-August was when I started this cut. And that was when the cheat meals end. And calories were up at like 4,800 calories a day, which is kind of where I need to be if I'm maintaining. It's like around 45 to 4,800 calories a day is my maintenance for, for what I was weighing at the time, which was about 250. Um, and so we basically cleaned up all the, the food and started slowly lowering the calories down and increasing the amount of cardio. Um, cause you know, I started out and it was five workouts a week for about 90 minutes and five cardio a week for 20 to 30 minutes. I think started at 20 and then it just kind of continues to go up. So you get more cardio, the food's coming down, the weight stay about the same. I mean, the only real change I made to my weightlifting program throughout the entire cut was um, about eight weeks out. I pulled um, squats out because it's just too dangerous. You don't want to get injured while you're at such a caloric deficit. And then about four weeks out, I pulled the rest of the free weights. So the last month I was just doing machine stuff and cables. But the cardio goes from, you know, 20 minutes, five times a week to 90 minutes, six times a week. And then even sometimes a few day, a few weeks, it would be more than that. And so, and the cut, the calories went from, um, 4,800 to like 2,200 on a low day. Um, so I'm burning at the end of it, I was burning roughly according to my watch, I was burning about 16 to 1800 calories a day eating 22. And then like the whole rest of your body burning up calories. Cause you're that, that exercise is not including just what your body burns normally. So I was in about a 3000 calorie deficit every day for like the last five to six weeks, which is wow. Yeah. I was, That's, I was seriously yeah. just like dying. <laughs> like I felt so bad about, so I really came to a breaking point at the weekend of Halloween weekend because I was just like, Literally, I was foggy headed all the time. I couldn't think. I couldn't focus. Um, I had no energy to do literally anything. Um, and fr that Friday, my husband was out of the house with staying with his boyfriend. My friends, uh, or my boyfriends, Nick and Robbie, and my friend Jason were here for Halloween weekend. And I woke up Friday night after everybody, after we'd oh, gone all to bed, I was alone in my bed and I was like locked in. I couldn't move. I like woke up and was just frozen. I'm laying there like, am I literally just going to like slip into a coma and die tonight? And no one's going to notice because I'm alone in this bed. And so about 15 minutes of like laying there, I finally was able to get myself out of bed, get some water. Um, my boyfriend came in and came in, heard me get up and like came to check on me and sat with me for about 15 minutes and was like, here's some candy because he's diabetic. And he was like, I think you're having low blood sugar. Have some candy. Let's wait 15 minutes. And if you feel better, we can go back to bed. And that was just like, okay, I think I might be at the edge of my limits of what my body can handle right now. Um, cause I also like by that Sunday, I think I had lost eight pounds in a week because we'd been pushing the food so low and the calorie, the cardio so high. 
and then like all the water coming off too. And so I was just like, I was a, I felt like a wreck. Yeah. So I'm guessing, cause I dived down for a photo shoot like 15 years ago. I mean, nothing compared to what you did, but I remember that when I was doing that, that like desserts and foods that I would normally never, I'd be like, Oh no. All of a sudden started looking like the most amazing thing in the entire world. Exactly the opposite. Actually, I really didn't really, I don't have a whole lot of cravings when I get on diet. Um, what really happens is I just am like, I just want food. I don't like, I would eat a bowl of plain cream of rice if I would feel full. Like it doesn't have, I don't get the specific like flavor cravings and really the sugar cravings just go away after a certain point because you just haven't been eating sugar. Your body's like, I don't need that. Then you forget how good fat tastes actually when it's been that long. You're like, cause you're, yeah, you don't necessarily need it. You're getting the fat. Like I was having peanut butter, but you forget how much, like how good butter tastes or like not chicken breast, like meat with actual flavor. Yeah. Cause you've just been eating like vegetables and hot sauce and, rice and chicken. Yeah. Was there ever a point where you're just like really wanted to say fuck this or were you just laser focused? No, I honestly like after that weekend for Halloween, I was so close to not making it to that show. I actually did have to like tell my coach, I can't go this hard for the next two weeks. I will not, I will just break and I won't make it. And so we pulled it back a little bit. Um, increase the carbs and decrease the cardio just a little bit. I think I was still doing like, depending on how I was feeling, it was somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes of cardio a day. Um, but we, we bumped the car, the calories up, um, to about 3000 a day, which is what I was doing last year. And that just let me kind of limp at where I was for the last, like we, it, we stopped pushing to cut more weight and just kind of limped in and I lost another pound over that week. And then, into the show. Um, and then I came in, um, like a good six pounds lighter than I did last year. Oh, wow. So I definitely lost a lot more fat and was leaner. So when you say cardio, are we talking 90 minutes all in one session? Or are we talking 30, 30, 30, 45, um, 45? What I would usually try and do is in the morning, get up and just do 60 minutes of cardio and then do the other 30, um, after my workout or sometimes I'd split it up and I would do like 15 before the workout, 15 after the workout, depending on how I was feeling, but it's pretty brutal. Um, and what are you doing for cardio? A lot of, so I got an exercise bike in, in my basement cause I was just like, I cannot be rolling out of bed and having to get dressed, drive <laughs> to the gym, do an hour of cardio, drive home, shower, and then get breakfast and get to work. It's just like, I can't do that. I need to just be able to like roll out of bed, hop on the bike, hop in the shower. Yeah. And then at the, any, any cardio at the gym, I would just do the Stairmaster. Um, Cause with that amount of cardio, I was starting to get saddle sores on the bike from the bike. What is that? Uh, where the inside of your thighs rub raw from the seat. Oh yeah. So I had to like, switch it up and do partially on the Stairmaster and partially on the bike. Jesus. Wow. Cause like, also this is not like you sometimes see bodybuilders doing like an hour of cardio and they're just like walking on a treadmill. No, this is me like going probably about 18 miles an hour on the bike for an hour. Wait. My heart rate is supposed to hit about 130 when I do cardio. Hold on. Eight. She, that's hauling ass on the bike. Yep. That's really hauling ass. Well, so yeah, so we, my coach always has me do it by heart rate. Um, cause I've got the Apple watch. And so yeah. the other weird thing is like, so when I'm in off season, you know, it's like to get to one thirty, I'm pedaling at like 16, 17 miles an hour. And as I start to do more and more cardio, 
my cardiovascular health gets really fucking good. And so to get my heart rate up to 130, I'm having to go a little bit faster. And then next week it's a little bit faster. And so you're pushing and you're like, I'm biking at like 18, 19 miles an hour. That's wicked fast. Yeah. And I mean, the problem, it started to become a problem because I was like, I don't have the energy in my body to keep the pace up and burn this many calories and go that fast. Jesus. Yeah. I think it works out generally when I do cardio, it works out to about 10 calories a minute. So for 90 minutes, I was burning 900 calories, rough, give or take. Yeah. For those of you watching, uh, for your average person, a fast rate is like 500 calories an hour. And that's like an average person really like actually pushing themselves. So 900 calories an hour is like 900 calories for 90 minutes. Yeah. I would have fallen off the bike and had a heart attack. Fuck that. Yeah, I mean, but that's what my coach wanted. I mean, he wanted me to be pushing myself as hard as I could for this competition. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So what was the hardest part of the cut for you? It was definitely the cardio. Like the diet kind of sucks. Um, and I didn't, It was, but like, I don't have those cravings and it's, relatively easy for me to stay on diet. It was just the exhaustion from not eating anything and doing cardio so much cardio that like my legs feel like lead every day, all day. And my brain feels fuzzy and I just couldn't think like, and I, and really actually, if you're going to, that's the physical, the, the mental was even harder than that for me because there was a period there. Um, the last, you know, three ish weeks where I hated everything about my life. I hated how tired I was. I hated how grumpy I was. I hated how I didn't have energy to do anything other than like work, work out. And that was, that was it. Um, I hated the person that I was because of all of that. Like I was, I'm I'm naturally a happy, excited, energetic person. There's, I've got a lot of joy in, in me and I like to share that with people. And the part the person that I was, it wasn't like I was just grumpy and angry and lashing out. I was just tired and reserved and a little, and generally just more defensive and prickly and just not someone that I like if, if I personally were to have to hang out with the person I was for those three weeks, I would be like, I don't want to be with this person. I don't want to spend time with this person. And that was really hard for me to be like, I don't like the person that I am. And it's all because of choices that I have actively made that have brought me to this point. And so it was just, it was a little, it required me to do a little bit of introspection to think about like, okay, this is completely optional. There's nothing that says I have to compete at all. Like it's, I generally enjoy it, but I did not like this cut. I did not like how it went. I didn't like how it, how I felt. I didn't like who I was. And so it, it prompted a lot of introspection of like, what do I actually want out of bodybuilding? Mm-hmm. I got okay. I got a question, but before I ask that question, how did this all impact your sex life? I had my first orgasm yesterday. That in <laughs> in about five weeks. Okay. Because essentially, I had no energy at all, and so like, even if everything worked, I had just no sex drive at all. Which is, it, that was actually really difficult this year too, because I had been having a really good time with my sex life and my sex drive and just feeling very in control of everything. And then I hit that point in mid October where it just shut down because I was so tired. And it was like, oh, great. There's another thing that I gave up that again, I chose this and I knew this was coming. And here we are and I'm miserable because of it. Why am I, why am I doing this? Yeah. Okay. I had a feeling you were going to answer that way because I definitely, it, completely different context, but I know what you mean when you get horny, but you're just so exhausted and you're like, no, you're like, I don't even care how high my drive is. I'm just exhausted. So my question though to you is 
why because you know you see a lot of bodybuilders i'm sure you're familiar with like rich piana um where you know a lot of bodybuilders like it will take a toll on them you know because they're like this is affecting my money it's affecting my job my family my relationships my everything like yeah so why why do we do it yes Basically. Yeah, I mean, so for the longest time, the reason that I competed was because I did that one. And what really enticed me about my first competition and what I really enjoyed was that there was this tangible endpoint, this goal to try and push yourself to. Because um, I'm the type of person that's always trying to be better. Um, mm -hmm. And so having something to kind of strive for, to push up against, to see where can I, where can I take this? How far can I take this? Um, it was always so interesting to me to see, like, what can I do with this? And then I think I finally hit the point of like, I've seen what I can do and I'm ready to step back and kind of, okay, maybe I don't want to compete anymore. And I, I think yeah. that was the result, the end result of a lot of this introspection and self-reflection that I did of like, I really love bodybuilding. Um, as an activity for me. Competing has always been a little bit weird because I hate the judging process. Um, yeah. I mean, it's the judging is subjective and um, uh, it, the judging is subjective. The judging is political and they play a lot of favorites and it's weird and it has all these odd little rules like, Oh, you painted your nails. That's actually not against the rules, but it's bad because it makes you less masculine or like you didn't, I've, I've been told that one of the things that would make me a more successful bodybuilder is if I worked out at the right gyms or if I went to the right shows, if I was more present in the sport. And so that's like, that part has always just like, whatever I would like to be. I like the, pushing my body to be bigger, pushing my body to be stronger, pushing my body to be leaner, getting my posing up to stuff. Cause I actually invested over the last two competitions pretty heavily in terms of posing coaching and the amount of practice that I did and to the point where my friends were saying, okay, you might not have been the biggest guy up there. You probably were the lean, one of the leanest guys on the stage, but your posing was better than everyone. And for somebody who historically my posing has been my weakest point, that was really, really cool to, to hear that like, okay, you actually got up there and you nailed all your poses and it looked really good. And the thing that you set out to do, you did it. And I'm like, okay, that I can, that I can be happy about. Um, but so I'm, I'm like, all right, I hated this contest prep. I don't particularly like the sport of bodybuilding and the organizing bodies that run it. It's really expensive to compete. Um, like I think, just the the day of the competition was a thousand dollars for me because you have your NPC registration, your registration for your class. Um, and I only do one class. Um, so it was like $150, but some people do open and classic and novice or masters. And so they're coming out like four or $500 for registration. Then you have your tan, which was seven hundred and seventy dollars you have to buy your posing trunks, which usually run about 60, 70 bucks for like a Jeez. little piece of fabric. Then you've got um, the hotel that I had to stay in, which I only had to pay for one night, thank God, because I was staying with friends Saturday night. But like that was $200. So like it, the Uber from um, Midtown to the hotel was like $100 because they, they host it in um, – Teaneck, New Jersey, and I was like, I'm not going to take drive up to Teaneck from DC and then have to figure out what to do with my car in Man Midtown Manhattan. I'm just going to take the train. But then it was so it's like a thousand dollars to compete just for one day, not counting the 16 weeks leading up to it, which is posing coaching and coaching and supplements and food and um, and 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 so like it's a very expensive sport, but the day of is the mo is even the most expensive part. And so it's just like, to me, I think I'm to the point where, you know, I've done seven competitions. 
I've won, I won my class once. I've gotten a lot of seconds. I got third in this last one in a very competitive class in the most show, competitive show on the East Coast, essentially. Um, I've been better every single year. I think it's time for me to step back from competing and focus on, all right, what does it look like to be a bodybuilder without that? Because 10 weeks into that cut, back in October, I was at my sister's wedding and in Ithaca, and there's this lovely gym in Ithaca that um, I always go to. Um, and I was like taking photos there and like for posing practice. And I was like, I look at those photos. And that was right when my coach went from 60 minutes of cardio to 90 minutes of cardio a day. And that's when it went from being like, oh, this isn't too bad to this is miserable. And I look at those photos and I'm like, honestly, I look maybe even a little better there because I'm not quite so gaunt in the face. And so I'm not so shredded. Like I'm really lean, probably like seven or eight percent body fat. I look really good, and that was the whole cut cut up till then was totally doable. Um, and then after that's when it got really difficult. After that was when I also started being like I'm doing damage to my body from pushing too hard. So what does it look like to be a bodybuilder where you do those cuts but you don't take them all the way to the nth degree for con contest prep? What does it look like to give yourself enough leeway to grow because doing a show every year, I've been stuck in heavyweight for seven years. I've never been, I've never weighed in on stage more than 223 pounds. Um, and if I did, didn't have to cut, cut down every year, I might be able to actually get some, put some more size on, which is something I've always wanted to do. Um, yeah. and it was also like, I did some thinking, some game theory thinking, going into the show of like, okay, this is show number seven. This contest prep has been more taxing on me, more taxing on my body, my social life, my mental health than ever before. Um, what, what are some possible outcomes here? If I win this show and I win my class or the overall, what do I need to then start thinking about national level competitions, which are more intense, more expensive. They're, they lead to pro cards, but realistically you have to, go to a lot of national shows before they'll let you in because they want to see you put your time in like Martin Fitzwater, who's an incredibly talented bodybuilder. He wanted his pro card so bad. I think he did three or four national level shows in a year um, before they let him win it. And this guy who I consider like top tier genetics, incredibly good work ethic, like, and they made him do all of that. And here I am. I'm like kind of an outsider. They're going to make me do a lot of shows. So then that's if I win and if I lose and I, I mean, I, losing is relative. I came in third. I'm very proud of that. Um, that third place because of the show that it was at and the way that I brought a much better package than last year, but I came in third. I killed myself. I spent all this money on posing yeah. practice and coaching and all of this and came in third. What would it take for me to come in first at that show? What would I have had to do? Um, to bump myself up two places. And do I have, do I have that in me? Do I want to have that in me? Um, so I looked at like those options and I was like, both of those really suggest maybe this should be the last time I do this. At least, I mean, some people are like, well, don't sell yourself short. You may come back in five years and say, well, I'm 38 now. Um, I can do a master's division. Um, and that could be kind of fun. I would be bigger. I would be, um, the masters can be a little bit less competitive, things like that. Um, but it's like, well, maybe now's a good time to take a, take a step back. Cause I also have a lot of friends who like, they do everything but the competition and they live a pretty awesome lifestyle. They look amazing. Um, and there's also just, I would like to, there are things that I want to focus on in my personal life that bodybuilding would hold me back from. Um, like, like what? Well, so I, I really want to travel more and that can be somewhat difficult. Like it's not actually that difficult when you're bulking or even like I did a decent bit of traveling in the first two thirds of this contest prep. It's just the last little bit. You really got to hunker down at home so that you can focus. Um, but I also like we have my husband and I have really close friends who are state department and they're posted in Mozambique right now. And they've, they've said, Hey, Anytime you want to come visit, take a trip, we'll make it happen. That's like, 
if we're going to go to Mozambique, we're going to do a two week trip down that way because it's, you know, 25 to 30 hours of flight time either way, a couple thousand dollars at tickets. Um, like it's hard to, to plan out a trip, like a week long trip to Palm Springs. Easy. There's a gym there. I, you get a kitchen. Like you can stay relatively bodybuilder friendly going on a safari in the middle of the ass end of nowhere, Mozambique. Like you're not going to be able to stay on diet super easy. You're not going to be able to, um, find a gym, which is fine. Like, a week or two is not going to kill you if you're just trying to be a big jacked dude. But if you're trying to be a pro level bodybuilder, that starts to be an issue. And so it's like, that's a thing that, that that's playing into this of like, I would like that flexibility to, to do those types of trips or like my, I have porn friends all over the country and all over the world. Like I just got a new job that is fully remote. I can work from literally wherever, as long as I'm working from nine to five, just need a laptop and a mouse and an internet connection. I could be in LA for a week. I could, which I'm doing at the beginning of December. I can be, I could go to Barcelona and like chill out during the day and then work from like three till midnight. And then like, that's really awesome. Like, but again, that becomes more difficult with bodybuilding because you've got to think about, okay, diet and uh, gyms and things like that. And so having a little bit more flexibility to maybe focus on other parts of my life. Um, and again, still stay as a bodybuilder, but not have to worry about the rigors of being a competitive bodybuilder. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a lot of your perspective change too, could be attributed to just aging because you start to realize what really matters, you know, and it, it seems like you're recognizing that, doing that really does affect your quality of life in just so many other ways. And you're just mm -hmm. giving up too much. It's like giving it up for what? Well, I think a lot of it also is just, I've done enough of it, like seven shows. I don't know. I don't think I know anyone personally, um, outside of like maybe my coach who's done seven shows. Like I've been competing. It's, it's the same thing. I've been in porn for since, um, 2016. I've been here been around forever. I know maybe like a handful of people who have been in porn as long as I have. Um, I've been in bodybuilding longer and com competitive bodybuilding longer than anyone I know. It's like at some point you say, you know what? I think I've checked that box enough times that like maybe it's time to look at what are your, what are your other options uh, to do with your life rather than just repeating it again and again and again. Yeah. And again, again, thinking like, all right, logically, where does it go from here? Like, do I really need a pro card to prove what, and what am I trying to prove by getting it? Like, am I then going to compete as an, a pro? Yeah. No. And one thing you said though, that I really wanted to, to dive into more of, because I think it affects everyone, even just your average gym goer is like, that bodybuilding culture, that very toxic, um, like you mentioned, Martin, um, him and I used to go to the same gym, Armbrust. Mm -hmm. Like, that gym is toxic as fuck. It's like IFBB Pro, like, there's the who's who of coaches, and it, yeah. What are your thoughts on all that stuff? <sighs> Feel free to go on a rant by all it's, means. It's interesting to me because there's like two different, you see different schools of thought on this. Like certain coaches are very much like, all right, bodybuilding is bodybuilding, but you've got to have to, you've got to be realistic with this. And like, um, I got a chance to meet my friend's coach. Um, one of my boyfriend's friends up in Boston, I met his coach at the show, he he actually won the overall at the show that I was at. Um, and he's very much like, he is starting to coach more. He was in, he is um, audio technician and music stuff. So he's kind of transitioning into coaching more, but he comes from like the real world. And so he's like, he posted something about for Thanksgiving, like, unless you're competing, you really have no reason not to enjoy Thanksgiving. Like nationals is in two weeks. So if two weeks after Thanksgiving, if you have nationals, 
you're not going to be able to pig out on that, uh, things, driven. but you might be able to have a little bit, but you're, you're going to have to stay focused. But otherwise, Jesus Christ, have a slice of pie or six, eat what you yeah. want for half a day. Um, but you see guys on the other end of the spectrum who are like, you, I don't care if you're not competing. I don't care if you don't have any goals. You need to just like only have a little cheat and you need to stay focused or otherwise you're not suffering enough to be a true bodybuilder. And I think like my coach is not quite that bad, but he definitely in the contest prep was basically like, you, you need to stop whining. You're a whiny little bitch. Um, this is what it takes. I've had people do worse and therefore you can do worse. And I'm like, that's not really the, the mindset that I want, the, the suffer for suffering's sake. I need there to be a reason for the suffering. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think, I think that bodybuilding has that tendency towards, for no reason other than to show off your macho t- toughness, that mm. you need to be suffering or feeling like you're dying. And I think a lot of the times I think it actually is detrimental to the progress you can make. I actually think um, my coach pushed me too hard on this contest prep and I could have made slightly better progress if we had not pushed quite so hard because at some point your body just like gives up. And I think I hit that point and my body was just starting to shut down. Yeah. And and there are ways that you could probably have done that. We could have done that cut where you ramp it up a little bit earlier and you kind of pulse modulate it so that you're going up and then you get a little bit of break and you go back up and you come back down. Um, so that you're not trying to cram, um, like the end of it is not just this four week sprint of death. Yeah. But I, I do think that bodybuilding has some really toxic tendencies towards overtraining, overworking, suffering for suffering's sake. Um, and just the prove your macho ness um, syndrome yeah. that it, it's wildly unhelpful. I mean, and so I get a lot of people who ask me for coaching recommendations and I have to be really careful because I, I ask them like, what are you looking for in a coach? Do you want somebody who's going to take you to a competition and get you as lean as absolutely possible? Is your posing is amazing at whatever, literally whatever it costs. Are you looking for somebody who is going to be there to tell you, all right, this is what you need to do in order to get to the body that you want, but also still be able to maintain a life. And so I have, I have some of either, like if you want to be a competitive bodybuilder, I'll I'll probably send you to my coach because he could be an absolute dick, but he knows what he's doing. And if you're looking for somebody who's going to understand lifestyle, I would absolutely not send you to him. I would send you to somebody that's going to be like, Oh, you only had 80% diet this week. That's okay. Let's see if we can get it up to 90 or 95 this next week. Um, or, Hey, it's Thanksgiving. Take the whole day. Like just eat whatever you want. Like it's important to understand that not everybody is looking to be a competitive bodybuilder. And I think a lot of coaches, and this is, this is a common gripe uh, between me and some of my friends is that there are a lot of bodybuilding coaches who have never actually lived in the real world outside of bodybuilding. Like they, they started bodybuilding in high school or whatever, and then they did their competitions. They got their pro cards and whatever, and they've always just made their money by coaching or supplement companies or any combination of that. And they've never really had this whole thing like of having a real job, like a desk job or construction job or you know, a place where you are, you have responsibilities and you can't just be brain dead all day or physically unable to move because you're so tired from the training. Like if, if you're a construction worker, like what do you do in contest prep if you're tired and you like can't swing a hammer or yeah. like for me, it was literally becoming detrimental where I couldn't focus during the day because I didn't have enough energy to think. I'm just sitting there looking at my computer screen, trying to think of what I need to draw and be creative. And I couldn't do it. And my coach was like, well, you just need to suffer. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This job pays my salary. This job pays my salary, which pays your salary. Like you need to live in the real world where I am an amateur bodybuilder doing this as a hobby, spending a lot of money and time and effort for a hobby. 
not. And so like we have this thing of coaches are really good at spending your own, your time and your money. And you have to be willing to push back against that because they just don't know or care. Yeah. No. And especially if someone's like a parent and has kids. Mm -hmm. Oh God. Like I am a single or I'm a sorry, married man with no kids and a relatively large income. So like this is and a remote desk job. I can't imagine even if, if I had to be in the office every day, I don't think I would have made it through this prep. Yeah. What about the politics? If you want to go into that, cause I'm, I, I used to date someone who competed, so I'm, I'm pretty familiar, but for the viewers, I mean, I, I exist so far outside of that realm. Um, it's definitely something that gets held against me. I think, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I sent the stage photos. I sent in the morning, I sent pictures to my coach being like, Oh, Hey, these are some of the guys that I was talking to. And he was like, immediately recognized one of them and was like, Oh, that guy's a dick. But I'm like, okay, if my coach is recognizing you from a photo, clearly you're well known in the, in the Northeast region, um, which counts in your favor. And then I sent him the stage photos and he was like, Oh, I didn't know this person, uh, the guy who took second from me was competing. He must have been trying to, he must have needed to get his qualifications for nationals. And I'm like, well, if you know that the judges probably know that as well. And I'm sure that plays into it because yeah. the difference between second and third is a national level qualification. So it's like, uh, okay. Um, yeah. so I'm sure that plays into it. I mean, I, again, I've been told that in order to be truly competitive, I need to be, showing my face at these events as much as possible, whether it be just attending the shows and talking to the judges as a spectator or working out at the right gyms. Like I go to just the closest gym in my house, which is a 10 minute walk and it's amazing. And it's a really nice gym and it actually has some seriously good equipment, but it's not a bodybuilding gym. So you don't get seen like if I wanted to compete in the mid Atlantic and be competitive, I'd go to the shop gym in Manassas, which is an hour and a half drive from here or DMV iron or any of, any of these gyms that are like associated with the people who run the shows. And if I wanted to compete more competitively in the New York area, I'd be going to those shows in the New York area and I'd stop in and get a workout at Ben Francis gym on Long Island, on Long Island. And I would go, to all of these gyms that are like associated with the promoters and that way they know your face and like, Oh, well, you know, it's really close between number 44 and number 42. Um, let's go with number 42. Cause we know him like that yeah. definitely plays a part. And I get it. I mean, bodybuilding is subjective and whatever, but it makes it frustrating when you're like, I'm here putting all this effort in and I'm not being judged objectively on the, things that I've been told that I'm being judged on. I'm being judged subjectively on the things that I told I was being judged on. Plus this other unknowable category. Yep. So it's not something that played heavily into my decision, but it was definitely at least in the back of my head when I was like, and this is just going to keep happening because I don't have it in me. Um, like if, if I could suck a dick and build up that goodwill, sure. By all means, like whatever, but I don't have it in me to spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars traveling to shows that I don't give a shit of rat's ass about, um, to kiss the ring or to go work out at these, um, gyms that are inconveniently located and sure they're great gyms, but it's not worth it for me to do that. Yeah. No, honestly, you you articulated that perfectly because I think that, honestly, I think that stops a lot of people from competing in bodybuilding because, you know, the person's like more introverted or, you know, they just kind of keep to themselves. And like you said, they don't want to kiss the ring. It's not like, you know, football or basketball where there's a clear cut winner. Yeah. It's subjective. It, it, well, and like there was that whole expose about the women's side of bodybuilding um, that was disgusting, incredibly predictable. Um, oh, not familiar. Um, 
Oh, I forget which magazine did it, but I think it was it, might, it was like Wash Post level uh, news organization picked up a story about the female side of bodybuilding and how much sexual favoring there is and like skeevy undercover or under the table dealings. And like, there's probably not the sexual side on the guy's side, but there definitely is the political kiss the ring and like get to know you. And what, what favors do you do? Um, stuff like that. Who knows who? And it's, I don't know. I think it makes the whole, it cheapens the whole sport. I think. I agree a thousand percent. But it's partially, I mean, it's the way that the whole thing is set up. Like the entire sport of bodybuilding in the U.S., pro level and amateur level, is controlled by one family. I did not know that. Yes, the Mannions own the entire thing, the IFBB and the NPC. Wow. And then kind of below that, you have the different regions, Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, um, and those are kind of the they are the little fiefdoms of certain promoters like Gary Udit owns the entire mid Atlantic region. You cannot really put on a show in the mid Atlantic without his blessing. And so like they have, you have to, if you want to win a show in the mid Atlantic, um, you kind of have to kiss his ring and stuff like that. If you, so it's just, it's hyper political and like it all, it's bullshit all the way up. Um, and you know, as somebody who has one foot in the professional architecture world and one foot in the porn world and one foot in the bodybuilding world, it's really hard to, um, manage all of that. And I would have to kind of jump more thoroughly into the, the bodybuilding world to make it worth it. And I just don't really want to, um, the other two worlds, bodybuilding and architecture, I can actually, you can get by on talent and charm without having to kind of bow down and kiss the ring porn people. I, people like me because I'm me and they accept me, even though I'm not fully committed to porn because you know, I've been here for a really long time and I have this yeah. reputation for being nice and being professional and really treating people with respect. Um, and that doesn't matter in bodybuilding. Like they don't care. They don't care. Yeah. Who, they don't care who you are as a person. They just care if how you are and how they know you. Yeah. Well, the other thing too about with porn is the fans are essentially voting with their dollars mm -hmm. for you because it's it, it really doesn't matter who you know as long as the fans like you. That's you know well, you're good. To a certain extent in OnlyFans, that's true. It's not always true. With well, studio, studio, yes, studio right. is very much there is a um a bit of who you know there. Um, yeah, partly just because it's like. There's so many people in the space that it's hard when I, un I understand from the casting director perspective, like it can be difficult um, just to like keep track of everybody because, and also because there's so much turnover. Um, yeah. But I mean, I have good relationships with the casting studios and even then I don't get a whole lot of work because my schedule is relatively inflexible. Uh, they always want to shoot Monday to Friday. And I'm like, I only get so many vacation days. Um, I'm not taking time off to shoot at the rate that you want to shoot me. Like that's, it's not worth it. If you can yeah. do weekends, we can make something cool happen. But, um, yeah. like, I maintain friendly relationship with them, like and no hard feelings. And if they reach out to me and they have a weekend, I'm like, yeah, sure. I'd love to. Oh. And that's when so usually stuff works. When you decided to take a step back from bodybuilding. Was there a proverbial straw that broke the camel's back? Was there a particular moment in time where you're just like, you know what? This isn't worth it. I'm done. Yep. I was, so I was thinking through all of this. I was being doing the, the work, um, essentially like self-guided therapy of what do I want? Why am I doing this? How do I feel? And coming to the, I hate myself. I hate my life right now. I don't really want to do this. And I submitted a check-in and my coach had said like a few check-ins ago, like, Oh, soon we'll do a refeed. And like a check-in went by another check-in went by and he was just like, no, keep pushing. And you know, so I'm very much when I'm doing my check-ins trying to communicate clearly 
how I'm feeling so that he knows like, okay, struggling. Like this is, this guy is not doing well physically. Like he feels bad. And he took that as you're whining. And so I got this email from my coach after like three times of like, you'll get a refeed soon of like, you are whining more than any client I have ever had. And you're awful and you need to push and da da da. And I was like, honestly, that was, that was the day where I was like, fine, I'm going to do this show, but I am not going to nationals no matter what I need to take a step back. I'm not doing anything after this. Like, and uh, I mean, I sent, I sent a screenshot of the email and my friends and boyfriends who are bodybuilders were just like, there's no way you're complaining more than his cl- than a, any client he's ever had before. You are not that bad. Um, and like, he's just overreacting anyway, but that was, that was it. That was because that was after that horrible Halloween weekend where I was just like, I'm so tired. I think I feel like I'm literally going to die. And for him to be like, you're whining like a little bitch and you need to shut up and put your head down and work harder. I was like, fine, if that's how this is going to be, I just, I can't do this anymore. I've reached my, my physical and mental limits. Um, and I'm done. I'm just, I'm done. Yeah. Now I mean, it's important to, to know where your limits are. And I, I didn't really. And then now I, now I do like, I found those limits loud and clear. Yeah. No, I mean, that's definitely a balancing act though. And you can apply that to virtually anything because, you know, it is important to constantly improve, to constantly grow, to constantly push yourself, but you're absolutely right. Everyone is going to have a limit where once you hit it, it's like, screw this. I don't even care anymore. Like, just that general principle. It actually you know, was really difficult for me after I hit that point to even just finish out the last ten days. I was just like, I had to. I had to literally sit down and be like, I'm going to do this. Sat down, went and spent the thousand dollars to book the ho- to pay for the hotel and the Amtrak and the everything, so that I was like, I'm locked in. I have to do this now because um, part of me just wanted to be like, I'm done. I'm not doing this. Sh-. And I'm really glad that I did go all the way and finish it up. Um, I got my stage photos, which I'm really proud of. I did a video project with, um, a videographer in New York on the Monday after the show. I have photos scheduled for Saturday. So I'm making the most of the fact that I really did push myself to a whole new level. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased that I was able to make it that way, but God, the feeling when I decided I'm not doing nationals because nationals is four weeks after my show. So it would basically have been like, I got a cheat meal Saturday night and then it's right back to 60 to 90 minutes of cardio a day and 2,200 calories a day. And I was just like saying no to that brought me so much relief. It was like, I feel free. Cause it also means like, okay, I had been talking with my friend Ryan who lives in LA of like, well, if you don't do nationals, you can come to LA for a week, work remote. We'll do comic con which would be, I've never done a Comic-Con before, but he was like, your costume's amazing. What? You should go to Comic-Con. And so it was like, oh, if I'm not doing nationals, I'm spending the $2,000 I'd be doing on nationals, not even that much, much less than that, to go to LA for a little while and do Comic-Con. And oh, like, wait, I'm not doing nationals. I can host Thanksgiving and not have to make all this food that I really want to eat and not get to eat any of it. Cause Thanksgiving is actually one of my favorite holidays. Um, for the past couple of years, I've hosted it myself for all of my friends that don't really have family plans, um, which usually works out to 10 to 12 people. And I go over the top on the food because I just, I love to cook. Um, and so being able to say, I'm not doing nationals. I can host Thanksgiving was like this massive, just swell of happiness and relief. And that was kind of the type of thing that got me through the last little bit of the contest prep. It was like, all right, I just have to make it to November 11th. And then I can have a little cheat meal, get back on diet. Cause like one of the things we're doing is it's called a reverse cut and I'm back on eating. I'm only eating about 3,200 calories a day um, now. And it'll, it'll slowly ramp back up, but it'll keep me lean as I come back away from this instead of just like blowing up into a fat balloon because you go back you, because you're not do, eating in a structured way because right now my metabolism was a little bit slow from the massive cut that we did. And so I need to be a little, you can, 
you need to be a little bit careful with how you back off onto it. But it, so it's difficult, but it's, it pays off. Um, but it was just this massive swell of relief of like, I can make plans for that period between November and the end of the year. I can, um, have planned Thanksgiving and this trip to LA and have friends come visit and Christmas and new year's and all of this fun stuff that I wasn't able to plan before. And so that gave me enough, um, joy to get through the last 10 days or so. Oh, excited. well, you get to live your life. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's what it really came down to that. Re- and that was what convinced me that I was making the right choices that I felt so much relief. Like you, you shouldn't hate what you're doing, especially when it's optional. Like, why are you, why would you want to put yourself in a position where you're actively choosing the most miserable path for yourself? Yeah. And, and when you, when you look at that and you say, I'm choosing this and I don't know why I'm choosing this and I don't know what I'm getting out of it at the end. I think it's, it's okay to set yourself up for that type of suffering if you are choosing it for a good reason, like let's say I really, really, really wanted to be a pro bodybuilder. Like since I was a little kid, that was my lifelong dream. And I mean, I, you know, guys like that, like Nick Walker and Marvin, Martin Fitzwater, like that was their dream. And I'm like, for me, it's like, wow, it'd be really cool to be a pro bodybuilder, to be like an out gay man. Who's a bodybuilder. Who's a pro level bodybuilder, but it's not like the only thing motivating me. Yeah. And so, like, I thought so, I could do it and stay true to myself, and I don't think I can. No, I think you definitely made the right decision. Because even just watching you during this interview, like, when you talk about going to L.A. or you talk about Thanksgiving, it's like your inner child starts to come out and your face lights up and you animate so much more. And, you know, it's when you're talking about the content, you're like, oh. It's like you're being dragged across class. It really did become this just like awful slog. The last two or three weeks, it was literally like I would get up for work or I would get up, do my check-in, do my cardio, go to work, work, work till five, five thirty, have my pre-workout meal, go to the gym, do my cardio, maybe hit the hot tub because I just like needed to relax a little bit, go home, take an edible, eat my last meal and go to bed. I was going to bed at like 10 o'clock because I was just tired and hungry and miserable. And I was like, the, the sooner I go to bed, the closer I am to being done with this. And that's not a way to live. No. So one thing you had mentioned earlier, I'm curious, cause you had mentioned like you always kind of wanted to be bigger, but you didn't really have that opportunity because you know, you're constantly having to die down for compete. I think, to compete, a lot of bodybuilders feel that way. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, you don't go back. And from this point on, you're just able to live a happy, balanced life, you know, eat what you want, but still have bodybuilding be a part of your life. What would be your ideal weight? Ooh. Right now, my, my target, which may go up once I hit it, is I'd like to get to 275 and reasonably lean Um, because the the biggest I've ever been is 260. And I was, I was still pretty lean with that. Like I still, I looked a little chunky, but I still had solid abs. And like, you could see the definition on my arms and a little bit on my legs. So like I was a pretty good 260 and I can send you a photo to post with this about that. I'd like to do that and hit 275 and then cut down to like 8% body fat. Like do a 10 week cut and get to where I would be if I was, you know, five, six weeks out from a competition. Um, and that, which I'm, I would guess if I'm going to be at 270, it would be like in the low two forties would be where I'd be. Um, and then who knows, maybe I'll just continue to grow and do like 285 with abs and cut that down. Cause I think the, the real thing when you think about, um, bodybuilding. I mean, one of the things I like about having a coach is that he writes me a diet plan and I can stick to it pretty easily. And so there's a baseline of like, all right, if I'm stressed, if I'm having a really rough week at work, I just have to say, all right, meal one, four eggs, two pieces of toast, a protein shake, meal two, 300 grams of rice and eight ounces of chicken. 
and like some salsa and some broccoli. Meal three, same thing. Meal four, cream of rice, protein shake, peanut butter. Like on a bad day, you just check the boxes. And then if you're having a good day, like this week is actually not too bad at work for me. And it's the first week out of the competition. So like for breakfast, instead of um, cream of rice, I had an egg scramble in a homemade corn tortilla. Really healthy, really, really delicious. I had some fun cooking it. Last night I made um, masa harina waffles. Uh, so corn flour waffles, fat, really low fat, um, no sugar, no fat, savory, and then did an air fried chicken over top of it with a mango pico de gallo. Super healthy, hit all my macros, delicious. But I mean, it took, it took some time. So it was like, on a good day, you have the flexibility to change it up, eat something that you're not, that's not like your diet, but it hits all the, the nutritional facts that you need. Um, and then like Sunday, I have brunch plans with my husband, which is going to be really exciting. So I have that flexibility, but I still have the rigid, the structure of a diet plan that's going to take me where I want to go. Yeah. And when you think about bodybuilding, like the reason that we bulk and cut and bulk and cut is because when you do those cuts, it primes your body to grow some more with leanly. The leaner you are, the more likely you are to gain muscle, not fat when you, when you're bulking. And so by doing it, but by doing it that way, where you go up, back down and you go up again, you're, you're growing in the most efficient way possible. The problem comes is when you go up and you come all the way down to nothing. When you do the, um, the bodybuilding competition, the last six weeks, you're really just like, you're stunting your growth. You're burning through muscle. You're messing up your metabolism. You're putting an incredible amount of strain and stress on your body. Like my, I went in for bench yesterday and my bench was terrible compared to where it normally would be because I've just was terrible. Uh, 315 for 1297. But I should, my usual is like 315 for um, like 13 to 15 reps for multiple sets. Uh -huh. So like it took a huge hit because, you know, I've been pushing myself to the absolute limit and it'll come back, but it's going to take a little while. And so it's just yeah. like the last six weeks or whatever of your bodybuilding competition, you're just putting so much stress on your body. You're doing, you're taking way too much in terms of drugs. You're taking the cardio to the absolute extreme. You're taking the weights to the absolute extreme. You're taking your diet to the absolute extreme. You're messing up your hormones. You're messing up your metabolism. Like the amount of stress that you're putting on your body there is much worse than on the beginning of the first two thirds of that contest prep. It's much worse than it is when you're bulking. Cause if you do a clean lean bulk where you're still eating relatively healthy, like if you do a dirty bulk on pizza and burgers and fries and things, you're obviously putting your health at risk. But if you're doing a, a lean bulk where you're just eating seven meals a day of chicken and rice and eggs and toast and pasta, like that's not that bad. That's not bad for you. Yeah. And then if you're keeping up with your cardio, so you're still doing 20 to 30 minutes of five times a week or something like that, you're going to stay pretty healthy. My blood pressure when I was 260 was totally normal. My doctor was just like, your blood sugar is great. Your blood pressure is great. All your labs look fine. And you're morbidly obese. I'm like, yeah, but I'm physically active and I eat a healthy diet. Like, what do you, what do you expect, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> like you're, you're used to morbidly obese being like 30%, 35% body fat. I am morbidly obese with 9% body fat. Like you can be healthy at that weight. But, um, yeah. I would say that I'm actually the, the least healthiest. I'm, I, in, in some senses, I'm the least healthy that I've been in a while right now because I've put my body through such a ringer and I need to give it some time to recover. Yeah. And I would like what are the to not do that again. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds like you're at the right place as far as mindset, balancing, you know, what you want versus what you're willing to sacrifice and just looking at overall health mm -hmm. as opposed to just, you know, like you said, those extremes are not healthy. Mm -hmm. Well, I've gotten a little bit of pushback um, from people who are like, oh, no, you have so much potential. You should still um, compete and stuff. And I'm like, I don't really care. And I honestly think the majority of people, like my fans, of the fans of Derek Bolt who want to see me um, as a porn star, are going to be happier with me being healthier, with me putting out content that I really enjoy making, with me being bigger. Like people like me when I'm bigger. And I think 
my most attractive is probably when I've cut down about halfway and I'm lean and shredded, but not like stringy and but competition level. Yeah, no. And also though, like a lot of uh, bodybuilders I know who retired from bodybuilding, but still bodybuild and still maintain the lifestyle and have kind of transitioned into, you know, being influencers or entrepreneurs, they all seem way, way happier after they leave mm -hmm. the sport, like across the board, at least from what I've seen. I would absolutely believe it. So what are the biggest takeaways for you? From, from this whole experience, like from your first competition to your last competition. I mean, I think the a really big takeaway for me is just that I have taken it to such a level where I've learned discipline and I've applied my discipline and I've really come away with the ability to do what needs to be done and to dig deep and find that path. Um, and also I think this last one was really important for learning some of those things about how to identify your limits, how to identify your, your goals and how to parse through, um, what do you actually want? Where, what's external pressure? What's internal pressure? What's kind of doing what you think is expected of you versus doing what you really want? Because I mean, there's. There is definitely a little bit of pressure of like people who think, all right, well, Derek has really good genetics and he's got the, the willpower and the like discipline, self-discipline to, to, if he really wanted to, he could be a pro guy, pro, pro level bodybuilder. Like I firmly believe that I have the potential to do that. I just don't think I have the, I would want to, um, um, make the sacrifices. I don't, yeah. I don't want to pay the cost. I think I have too many other things that are interesting to me in my life um, that I would have to give up. And I think that was one thing in past years, it has been a little bit more manageable. Um, and this year, the number of things that I had to sacrifice in order to make it to this competition was just more than I wanted. Like last year, the prep was a little bit more doable. So I had Halloween plans with my boyfriends and it was actually really fun. And like, I had the energy to go out and, do some dancing and go to parties and things like that. And we tried this year and I was literally a zombie. Like we spent a bunch of money to go to one of the part Halloween parties here. We had these cute sailor moon costumes and I was literally just like, I sat on a couch half the night because I was so tired and it was just like, I, and I mean like I gave up my birthday is in October. I didn't get to have a slice of pie or cake. Like, wow. I gave up that. Um, it, there are a lot of things that you have to give up and it's just like, you have to ask yourself, are the things that I'm giving up worth what I'm getting in return? Mm -hmm. And in past years when it was less that I gave up, it was easy to say, you know what? No, I really do enjoy competing. And I think it is worth it to me to be giving these things up to push for it. And I think this year I was like, you know, the number of things I had to give up to make it to this was higher than last year. And it's now across the threshold to where it's not worth it. And it took, it took a little bit of being honest because you get, you have to push past that, that sense of like, well, I've done it before, so I should be able to do it again. And like, I've just, I'll, I've been doing this for seven years. I should be. And I, <laughs> I, my friend says, I always go shooting on myself. And it's like, well, stop that. <laughs> But it took well, some honesty, like to myself, to really sit down and go through, like, be open to whatever kind of came through my head, and listen to where my feelings were. Yeah, and I think that that's a really big takeaway of like, if you're going to do something like a bodybuilding competition, you got to really ask yourself, like, what are your goals? I tell people who say that they're doing their first one, like, I need you to not stress out about this. I need you to say my goal of this bodybuilding competition is to get up there and look like I belong on this stage. That should be your only goal. Your first time. I don't want you to worry about placing. I don't want you to worry about, um, 
who you're competing against. I really just want you to go up there and do it for yourself so that you look good and you're happy with what you bring. Mm -hmm. And like later you can get into, okay, I'm really good at bodybuilding. Maybe I want to start winning shows or I want to go to a pro card or whatever, but your first one, do it for you and see if you like it. And then maybe you do a second or a third, or maybe you go, you know, I really liked the way I looked, but it wasn't worth it. And I just want to do the one. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think also, too, it's as far as what you're putting into it, everything else you could put your money and time and effort and energy into, you get stuff back from it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, bodybuilding, what, you need a $5 trophy, what do you do? It's not like I don't have a bunch of them right up there. (laughs) Exactly. I don't know. It just feels like you get a lot more out of everything else. Mm-hmm. Well, again, I was talk- thinking to myself of like all my friends who are bodybuilders, but don't compete who seem happy and they are jacked. Like a, a friend in um, Atlanta who he can't compete because he's um, an orthopedic surgeon. So like his schedule just would not let him be a zombie for six weeks. Um, but he does the whole like, cuts down, bulks up, cuts down. He looks incredible. He's amazing. He's, he looks like a bodybuilder. He just doesn't compete. I'm like, if he can do that and be happy and be an uh, an orthopedic surgeon, like I can do that and be an architect and be happy and still look amazing. And like the cost of coaching and of doing the negative costs of staying on a bodybuilding lifestyle are not that much compared to like, okay, I will like how I look. I like how feel I will be enjoying my workouts because I mean, that's a, that's what got me into bodybuilding is that I liked working out. And this past four weeks, I've really hated the gym because it was like, I was t- so tired. I was dragging myself in to do a boring machine work, safe workout and not really getting to push myself in the last two days. Yeah. I've been like really excited to go into the gym and be like, I'm going to do chest and I'm going to actually get a bench press. Yeah. And my chest is a little further today. I'm like, Ooh, it's kind of nice. So what do you have any other advice you would give to someone who is maybe thinking about competing um, or considering it? I always, I, I would think if you've got the, the muscular development to do it, it's worth doing once um, just to see if you like it. And then you really should sit down and ask yourself, like give, give yourself a post show rebound of like, did I enjoy this? Why did I enjoy this? Do I want to do another one? Why do I want to do another one? If I want to do another one, where, where am I going with this? Ultimately, I would also say, um, if you're going to do a show, um, the two things that you should probably think about doing is hiring a coach, at least for your contest prep. Um, because it just, it makes it so much easier and you will have a better overall experience and you just have to pick your coach very carefully. Um, to find one that's not going to, that's going to be a good match for you. And then I would say the other thing is to hire a posing coach. Um, cause I remember from my first one, I had no clue what I was doing. Like I knew what the poses were cause I looked and I did them so poorly because, you know, it's really hard to learn the very specific poses, um, from the internet, just watching the YouTube videos. Like the most important thing I did for getting my posing from like, adequate to excellent was hiring the right posing coach. And it was, I spent $400 this year on posing coaching alone. And I hate to say it was actually worth it because my posing was my biggest improvement from last year. So that, that would be where I would put, if, if I was going to do a show for the first time or if somebody wanted the advice, it would be figure out why you're doing it. It would like do it and then give yourself a reason to figure out why you're doing it before and after. Um, and then get professional help because it will make it overall, you will, I think you will get a better result and you'll also know a little bit better, like if you want to keep going, what it's going to look like. Cause you can, you can do your own cut and you're going to be like, oh yeah, I looked good on stage. And then you go to, to the coaching level and it's like, oh, this is way harder than what I did. Cause like when I coached myself, I don't think I ever did more than 45 minutes of cardio in a day. And then I went to a professional and it was 90, 90 minutes for six weeks, six days a week for six weeks. 
So like huge difference in effort level, huge difference in leanness. Like I was much leaner with a professional coach. My posing is significantly better having hired a pro. Yeah. But it, if you've never done a, co a competition with a coach, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, yeah, I remember one time I hired a posing coach just because I wanted to learn how to pose just to learn. That is a hundred times harder than what you are like, mm -hmm. you know, you watch like a competition, you just kind of guess what they're doing and you're like, oh, I'm going to do this and this. And then you realize, no, you actually need to turn your hips this way, point your foot this way. And like, it feels it is so exhausting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so weird. But like, how did it, yeah, how did it feel when you're up on stage posing? Do you ever feel like you're going to pass out? No. I mean, so thank God my coach is not one of the crazy people who's like, oh, you're going to take a shit ton of diuretics and like throw your fluid balance off. And blah. like he, he doesn't do any of the crazy stuff. So I always feel pretty normal on stage day, which is great. Um, it's very, I get very tunnel vision. -y. Like you get up there and there's lights in your face that are so ungodly bright. You, I can barely see the judges who are sitting six feet in front of me. Um, so my focus there is I'm just listening for the, the audio cues of what pose to hit next and focusing on my posing and that's it. Like, I'm not thinking about who's next to me. I'm not thinking about my friends out in the audience. I'm not even listening for posing coaches. I'm literally thinking, all right, they just called side chest. All right. What do I do for side chest? Uh, what are the, like biggest thing? Okay. Clench glutes, Kegels. Got it. Or like it's back lat spread. Okay. Let me. Get, get in there, lean back, and squeeze those glutes as hard as I can. Get it really nice and tight. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So it's like it, it's I'm I might as well be up there all alone. No, no one else. Just listening to audio poses, um, which is probably the way to do it. Like you don't want to be distracted. Okay. So million dollar question: What is the first? cheat meal you had after this living hell you went through Diner food so we um we had a i think i had like a dozen people show up to my show so i just was like i want somewhere that's i can make a reservation for eight or twelve and they're not going to be mad if i'm half an hour late because you never know what time you're going to get done with your show i have to shower first because i'm covered in this disgusting tan um and it's like the best feeling ever when you shower so we, i was like you know what a new york city diner sounds amazing so like we got in, I ordered an espresso martini because I like espresso martinis, um, coffee and alcohol. Great. And I hadn't had a drink in 16 weeks or something like that or more. Cause I typically, I don't drink on contest prep. I rarely drink in general. Um, but yeah, so I had an espresso martini to start. Um, my boyfriend, one of my boyfriends who was, they both came to the show, which was amazing. I was so happy they were able to come to my last one. Um, they were my, one of my boyfriends was finishing up like a pretty significant cut at the same time as me. He didn't compete. He probably could have, but he just didn't want to. Um, so he was doing like his first, um, or he was doing his like, finally I'm done cutting meal too. So we split chicken and waffles and we split some mac and cheese. Um, we each got our own burger, yum, and fries. Um, we got really good crispy Brussels sprouts for the table and something else for the table. And then Jeez. after the burgers, uh, he and I split a peanut butter banana sundae. And I was just like, oh, this is so good. All of it was absolutely to die for. I mean, like, we were, there was talk about going to, like, a fancy Michelin star restaurant. And I'm like, I don't know if I would have actually appreciated it because I was so hungry. Sure. But diner food was absolutely excellent. And then um, the next morning we went to a Greek brunch place. And it was like, we got Greek French toast to split and shakshuka for the table and spanakopita. And I did these delicious lamb gyro sliders that had like, it was like a pita with shaved lamb and Greek stuff or Greek um, tzatziki and tomato and feta and just like, oh, so fries again, because I love fries. So good. Nice. And then like Monday morning back on diet, like 
I had um, protein waffles and a, some yogurt, and that that was my breakfast. And then chicken and rice for lunch, chicken and rice for dinner. Like it after a weekend, uh, after Saturday and Sunday of just eating absolute crap all day. It was. It's kind of nice to get back to a somewhat regular schedule. And then I was in New York for two days, so it was kind of like very basic because I'm staying in someone else's house. So I don't want to like go crazy on the kitchen. And now that I'm back in DC, I'm doing stuff like, you know, the masa harina waffles or make your own tortillas because why not? I'm getting a little bit inventive with the foods, but it's nice. I love to make. No, I, I did see all your, your picks from your competition. You looked freaking amazing. Thank you. Yeah. I'm actually like, I'm splurging a little bit and I'm getting one of them. Um, the photographers like everything in bodybuilding gouge you beyond all belief. Oh, the, my. like they, I bought a, package, um, and they're like, they said up front, like, okay, it's going to be only social media resolution. So they're all like low sample, but I'm like, okay, I really would like to print one of these. Um, cause you know, I, I'm an architect. I do, yeah. I, I have a tendency to be very picky. So a lot of my prints at home are metal. Um, and so I was like, I need a full res image. And they're like, oh, well, you already paid for the photo, but only social size. So if you want to pay, if you want a full res, it's $80 for a digital image. For one fucking for picture? One image that they already took. <sighs> fucking vampires. Uh, so I'm splurging for that. Wow. Nice and big on metal, but like, Jesus Christ. 80? Okay, that. That's on top of already having spent $300 with them. I thought I knew price gouging. That's absurd. No, well, and also they are very strict at the show. You are not allowed to take cell phone videos or pictures. No, what? Phot- no photography of any type at the show. You have to buy the stage photos. <sighs> yeah, it's a it's a racket. I mean, there's a very good reason why I'm like I'm really financially. It's going to be way cheaper not competing. Like nationals would have been two thousand dollars. I was like. Four weeks of torture and two thousand dollars. I could literally um, book a cruise for myself and my husband for a week for that amount of money, and go on vacation instead. And I would enjoy the hell out. Well, that's of it. just two thousand dollars for the day. That's not counting all the costs that you're incurring prior to that day. Mm-hmm. I'd be five, six, seven, eight grand easily. Yeah. So I was just like, yeah, I'll do nationals. That's I mean, no, no, thank you. I don't, I don't need to spend that type of money. So it's like, I mean, that, and it's everything is so expensive. Like posers are overpriced and photography is overpriced and like they charge through the roof. And it's just like, gee, I don't even, I didn't even look at what the ticket prices were, but I feel kind of, I always feel guilty when people come to my show because they're, I know they're getting fleeced for the tickets to watch. And I'm on stage for maybe five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a racket. It's a racket. And like, I'm glad it's over. But yeah, yeah. So I'm going to, I'm really glad I, I am really glad I did pay for the stage photos though. Cause I will be, it will be nice to have them and to be able to, and I, it will be nice to print one very nice and big. Cause I did that in a prior year. One of my, the showdown in Woodbridge that's run by those two lovely um, women, they just um, pay the photographers um, a flat fee and everyone gets their photos and they just roll the price of the photography into your classes. But because everyone's doing it, it actually makes it more affordable. So instead of it being like 130 to register, it might be 150, but then you get your photos at the end of it. I'm like, that's a pretty good deal. Oh, that actually sounds like they know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So I have phot- photography from my earlier shows that's full res, and I had one of those printed, and it is really nice to have on the wall. And I did, I mean, I sold my posing trunks. Um, I don't know if you saw that one on Twitter. I was like... I saw that tweet. I was wondering, I'm guessing someone easily... The winning them. bid was 250 bucks. Okay. I was like, okay. I mean, like I, I've sold underwear before usually for, I'm definitely not for that much, but I was like, this is kind of special. I mean, I wore these posing trunks for like four weeks without washing them for my uh, check-ins and then all day on stage. Like 
they're pretty they're, that's pretty a unique item if you are into like the the used underwear crowd. Yeah. Oh. That's awesome. I mean, and you've got the uh God, what's the the word for that? Like when you bury a bottle, like a time capsule. Mm-hmm. Like you've got something to forever remind you of this moment. So, yeah, I mean, and it'd be again if I'm not going to do this again, at least for if I do do masters, it's like five more years. If I'm not going to do this for a long time, it's nice to have to wrap it up all nice and neat and really take the the effort to close out that chapter of your life well. That's why, like. I did the videographer project on Monday, which I'm really excited to see how that turns out. Um, Because I've never done, I've never really worked with a videographer for something artistic before. It's always been porn. And so when I got the chance, someone reached out to say, hey, I do porn shoots, but I'm also a commercial photographer for for brands and commercial videographer. I'd love to do something artistic with you. I was like, absolutely. I think that would be really fun. Yeah. And then I have a photo shoot scheduled tomorrow. Um, just again, capturing what all the hard work I put in before I like don't do it again. No, no, it, it really does sound like you've had one heck of a journey and it's really interesting to hear your takeaways and see how it's impacted you, the positives and negatives. And I think you're, you're wrapping it out wrapping it up on a positive note and really just, Mm -hmm. I I think you're going to be a heck of a lot happier moving forward. Well, I think if I, if you had to ask me, I would say I don't regret it. I don't regret anything at all. I think I made all the right decisions of when to start and how many competitions to do and what to do and all of that. And I'm pleased with my choices. I'm pleased with my outcomes. And I also think that now is a really smart and, responsible time to say, I think I've taken this to a nice logical conclusion and it's time to say, I'm proud of myself. I'm happy with what I've done and it's time to move on. Yeah. I think that that is definitely something I wouldn't have been able to do five years ago. I think the age has age and maturity has helped me make that decision better. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Getting, <laughs> that's one of the major positives of getting older. Mm-hmm. That maturity. But, uh, yeah, and just the perspective and you realize what really matters and all the rest just kind of fades away. So, um, for anyone who's watching this and wants to follow you on social media, Twitter, all that good stuff, where can they find all your uh, Twitter is Derek Bolt XXX. Uh, Instagram is Derek Bolt Fit. Um, I have a new Twitter, Derek Bolt Bakes, um, that you can follow if you want to see any of the stuff that I've been baking now that I'm a little bit more free. Um, and then uh, OnlyFans is also under Derek Bolt XXX. And I'm excited to get back to doing OnlyFans now that I have a sex drive again. I've, I've had enough content to kind of like space out that five week period. And I'm um, like, oh, I get to make new stuff. Um, so that'll be really fun. I'm excited about that. All right. Hey guys, just want to say thank you for watching this video. And if you did really enjoy it, I just wanted to mention there are two ways that you can help to support this channel on the right side. There are three little dots. If you click those, there is a super thanks button. And on the left hand side, there is a join button where you can join this channel There are three different tiers of memberships. The top tier does actually allow one-on-one messaging with me via Discord. And I personally answer that it is not a service. That's just, you know, both of those are ways that you can help support me as a content creator in this channel. I mention this because YouTube is by far the thing that I enjoy doing the most. It's the thing I'm most passionate about. And unfortunately, a lot of the sexual videos the porn star confessions, the dom sub, all that stuff. It is not monetized due to the nature of the videos. But either way, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I hope you guys all have an absolutely amazing week. I love you all.